Hello. Good afternoon. So uh, my name is Anna Lapuk, and um, I have been uh, working in the cancer bioinformatic field for um, since probably 2001. And um, originally, I come from Russia, Moscow, and I did my PhD in molecular biology, studying the evolution of a human genome. And then I moved to California and worked in um, uh, University of San Francisco Comprehensive Cancer Center as a postdoc for a number of years, working on the genomics of breast and ovarian cancers. And then um, I spent a few years in uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, working as a computational scientist there, and um, really uh, focusing on the development of uh, genomic and transcriptomic biomarkers for breast and ovarian cancers. And um, in 2009, I moved to Canada, to Vancouver, to join um, Vancouver Prostate Center, uh, which goal is to find the best cure for the prostate cancer. And since then, I've been working in prostate cancer field and mostly, uh, again, focusing on development of uh, biomarkers. And I do, as a scientist, I do have a special interest uh, in alternative splicing of messenger RNAs. Um, I'm not going to talk about it today at all, but um, uh, basically my research is more translational research. So uh, uh, the uh, prostate center um, is focused on development of uh, new clinically uh, useful biomarkers and new therapeutics, including small molecules and antisense oligonucleotides, and advance them all the way through the clinical trials. So um, uh, today I will be talking to you about the integration of very important data, uh, clinical information data, with genomic and transcriptomic and other omics data um, that uh, one can get for, um, um, uh, from the uh, modern technologies. So um, the module will be um, organized in three uh, parts. In the first part, I will introduce you into the clinical data and um, biomarkers. In the second part, I will describe you the statistical aspects of development of biomarkers. And the third part will be uh, the lab, um, where you will have your hands on the most important part of um, uh, of the analysis, which is called survival analysis. So the learning objectives of this module is to basically understand what the clinical information is and how it can be used, to understand the process of its integration with high resolution data, and then we will review the uh, current advances on the biomarker uh, development um, front. Then uh, the last two bullet points will be addressed in the lab that we'll have in the end of the module. So you will basically learn to evaluate the biomarker and perform survival analysis, very basic type of it. And also you will be able to play with the tumor cohort high resolution data, um, uh, gene expression and copy number data and to learn basically how to deal with the question of where do we go next after we get the high resolution profiling of tumors. So what is the clinical data? Clinical data is a set of information um, about the patient and his or her disease. It usually um, includes a number of parameters that you can see listed here on this slide. So um, the important um, uh, pieces of information is race, family history of cancer, the nodal status, whether cancer has spread to regional lymph nodes, then um, the presence of uh, um, treatment, it's radiotherapy or chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, um, then these uh, results of staining with some important proteins that are involved in etiology or progression of the disease, such as um, hormonal receptors for um, cancers of reproductive system, then size of the tumor, stage of the tumor, and so on and so forth. Um, there is also a very special type of clinical information data which appears right at, in, at the bottom of this list. It's in the italic bold font. And that is an information that has something to do with a certain time. So it's, you know, sometimes it's um, time from diagnosis to the recurrence, from surgery or other treatment to the disease recurrence, from um, 
um, on, onset of the disease to the death of the patient of the disease. And this type of data is a very special type of data. It's called survival data. And it requires special uh, analytical approaches. And we will be learning about them later in the module. Clinical data alone uh, has been uh, used for quite a long time and um, uh, more or less effectively uh, uh, to aid clinical decisions to predict the behavior of the disease in patients. And this is normally done uh, through a development of a nomograms, um, such as the ones that I'm showing you here uh, for the prostate cancer here and breast cancer here. So this is a certain score that is being developed based on a set of clinical parameters, um, such as age and hormonal status, so on and so forth, tumor grade and, uh, you know, uh, family history, so on and so forth, to um, calculate a certain score that will reflect the risk of the disease recurrence. And normally, these, there are quite a few nomograms that have been developed for prostate cancer that uh, use slightly different um, scoring system and different set of clinical parameters. And they are more or less um, um, accurate. So the accuracy ranges actually from somewhere 0.6 to all the way 0.9. And um, this is how the clinical data has been used alone. From the other hand, now we live in the era of new technologies that, you know, make it possible to profile cells, um, tumor cells at unprecedented level of resolution. And so we, we do um, have a huge amount of omics, cancer omics data that's available to us, um, including transcriptome profiling, genome profiling, methylome profiling. Uh, proteome profiling, and then this data gives us hundreds to thousands of different operations that somehow are believed to contribute to the disease. And so the ultimate goal of having all of this technology and all of this data is to be able to use it to improve the clinical decision. So this slide shows you an example of how single nucleotide variants, for example, can be used to help clinical decisions. So um, we, um, we profile the genome and we identify um, all of the variants. And you had a specific module focused on that specifically. And just to remind you, um, this stage is composed of three steps. So we line the sequence to the um, a human genome assembly. We find things that are different between two more normal tissue, and then we do molecular annotation of those variants. And these variants are actually our biomarkers, but then um, potential biomarkers. But then the question is, uh, what is going to be the clinical use? And the clinical use is um, sometimes calls, uh, is called uh, clinical interpretation. So it means basically what uh, usage we can derive from this information. For example, is this mutation um, diagnosis a certain subtype of tumor? In that case, it will be diagnostic marker. Um, is this mutation capable of predicting response to a certain therapy? In that case, it will be predictive biomarker. Is this um, variant associated with patient's outcome, for instance, shorter survival or longer survival? In that case, it will be um, prognostic marker. And so once we identify its potential clinical use, and then we prove that this clinical use is indeed very robust, and there are a number of steps that um, are needed to be gone through in order to evaluate the clinical significance of a biomarker, then this biomarker can aid clinical decisions. So now let's recall what the biomarkers are and what the therapeutic targets are. Um, people very often confuse the two, but actually they're not always the same. So biomarker is a biological molecule found in um, uh, bodily fluids and secretion um, or in tissues that is a sign of a normal or abnormal process. Therapeutic target is also a biological molecule, but it is a molecule that, um, um, that can be modified by the external stimulus. And that external stimulus, in our case, is drug. So once the molecule is hit by the drug, its behavior is changed. For example, we have a signaling molecule, for example, tyrosine kinase um, a receptor, and it tra transduces signal. 
uh, and then once we inhibit that uh, receptor, then it stops um, transmitting signal. So that's the example of a target. Sometimes uh, therapeutic targets are the same as biomarkers, but not necessarily. Very often they're different molecules. So biomarkers um, have certain features. So um, first of all, they can come from different sorts of aberrations. It can be a mutation, both uh, somatic and germline. It can be an amplification of a gene region or um, a certain focal region of the genome involving several genes. It can be transcriptional change. For instance, um, transcriptional upregulation or downregulation without any underlying genomic change. It can be also post-transcriptional modification. For instance, it can be production of the alternative um, RNA isoform, or it can be post-translational protein modification, such as excessive phosphorylation of a protein. And because this is a um, biological molecule, it can be any kind of biological molecule. It can be protein, nucleic acids, including coding or non-coding. It can be cells, actually. It can be not only molecules, but it can be individual cells, and I'll give you an example of that. It can be peptides, and um, historically, bi um, biomarkers were considered to be single entities, such as single gene or single protein. But now, more often, biomarker is a panel of, um, uh, of, uh, of units, such as genes. So it's, for example, the gene expression signature, or proteomic signature, or a metabolomic signature. <coughs> so the biomarker, <coughs> biomarker goal is <coughs> to screen, right? And so the most attractive feature of a biomarker um, is is that uh, that is um, uh, the least invasive. So if it can be screened in the uh, secretion or in bodily fluids, plasma, urine, um, blood, the whole blood, then it's a way better biomarker because it's uh, it's not invasive and it can be repeated over and over again along the progression of the disease, so that we can monitor this uh, the disease state and the evolution of, of, um, um, of, of the um, cancer in, in patient. Um, less desirable, um, it can be screened in tissues, and that implies taking a biopsy, usually through needle biopsies, um, and then staining for a certain biomarker for protein level or mRNA level, and then uh, followed by imaging. So uh, as I mentioned, biomarkers may or may not be the same as therapeutic targets, and here I give you a few examples. HER2 in breast cancer, or ERB2, um, tyrosine kinase. Um, um, uh, so it's both a biomarker and a therapeutic target at the same time. So Herceptin is a um, therapeutics that specifically targets HER2, and it's effective in patients who have HER2 amplification. And so in that case, um, when uh, th there needs to be a decision made with regard to whether to treat a breast cancer patient with Herceptin, then the patient is tested first for the status of HER2. So this is a companion test for HER2 status, and which is um, used in combination with a treatment regimen. PSA in prostate cancer, prostate-specific antigen, is widely used biomarker for um, for prostate condition, actually, uh, in a bit of broader um, uh, scope. Um, but it's a prostate cancer biomarker, but it is not a target because it's a um, effector molecule. So it's downstream of the androgen receptor, which is a steroid hormonal nuclear receptor, which drives cancer and which is a target for a specific treatment. Now, another example in colorectal cancer, the KRAS mutations, which is a biomarker uh, of sensitivity of patients of the tumors to EGFR treatment. So again, biomarker is different from the target. So I already mentioned that it is important to understand and to establish the clinical use of a biomarker. 
and um, I have already um, gone through that. So here, um, again, I'm giving you um, the definitions and examples of different types of clinical use of biomarkers. Diagnostic marker is used to diagnose or subclassify the disease. Um, and examples are in uh, leukemia, for instance, very characteristic fusion um, BCR able. There is another um, uh, example that appeared just a few years ago in prostate cancer, very spe prostate specific fusion uh, tempers to ERG that is present in more than 50% of prostate tumors. A uh, prognostic biomarker is used to make prognosis about a clinical outcome of the patient. So, for instance, survival or recurrence. And the example of these kinds of um, biomarkers would be the gene expression panel um, on Oncotype DX for breast cancer recurrence uh, estimation. Then predictive markers, for instance, to predict the response to a given therapy. And um, as I already uh, described to you, HER2 is one of the examples, or KRAS mutations. A 4EGFR treatment is another example. And then uh, there is also a so-called um, companion diagnostic markers, which are a subtype of predictive biomarkers that are used in combination uh, with um, with the treatment itself, but d they do not provide an independent um, prognostic and predictive strength. So, and the example of that would be the activating mutation in BRAF uh, for the treatment um, for sensitivity or response to treatment um, in um, melanomas uh, with BRAF inhibitors. So, this table now uh, expands on examples of clinical use of uh, biomarkers, and I hope uh, you can see it clearly here. So uh, again, uh, th this is the uh, example of a germline mutation that can be used to, to um, uh, estimate the risk of developing cancer during lifetime. Then the screening biomarker already described to you, PSA. Then differential diagnosis, and the fusions are very specific for prostate cancer, for instance, yes? Can you explain the difference between uh, from, uh, uh, Predictive marker and a companion diagnostic again because we have six separate mm -hmm. uh, that would actually predict response to the to therapy. But if you just take that mutation in that particular cancer alone, it's not it's not a biomarker by its own but by itself. So it's only with regard to the treatment. So that's why that's why they're used in combination. There's this is a very subtle difference, yeah. but um, they are called companion. Yeah, because a predictive marker mm -hmm. also has to be seen in the light of treatment. Yes, yes, in light of treatment. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to just understand. But so you're saying yeah. this, this, this it's it's subtle. it's very subtle difference. Yeah, but uh, um, basically the thing is that they're not they're not powerful enough and they're not um, useful. In in the context outside of the treatment with specific um, <coughs> specific therapy. So and here um, uh, we can predict um, response. Um, I already mentioned that, and then we can monitor the disease recurrence. Um, these are a set of uh, markers that exist out there. And then we also can monitor response or progression um, of metastatic disease. So now this slide summarizes the biomarkers that have been approved and are um, used to, um, to aid clinical decisions currently. So they have established clinical utility. And actually, um, you know, it's, it's good that we have, you know, several markers for several cancer types. But yet, um, cancer research field, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually you know, decades long, and um, a lot of research has been invested into this field. And so the reasonable question would be why there are so few of biomarkers that have established clinical utility. And I actually have to, uh, you know, note that there are a number, many more biomarkers that are under development currently, but the clinical utility has not been established yet. And so the reason for that is actually that the process of developing a biomarker is very tricky and very prone to bias. Uh, 
So, um, as I mentioned, multiple types of aberrations can give rise to biomarkers. And um, so one of them are fusions, um, as I mentioned. And so, for example, here in um, lung cancer, uh, the ALK fusions are, um, um, uh, are um, a type of a fusion transcript biomarker. <laughs> so um, these uh, fusions that involve different partners, um, very often it's EML4, but it may be different partners, but um, it's always ALK that is being um, fused to another gene, and as a result, um, ALK is constitutively active. Um, and this happens in uh, approximately 2 to 7 percent of um, non-small cell lung cancers in uh, adenocarcinoma type and mostly non-smokers. And so it is considered to represent a certain subclass of lung cancers. And ALK inhibitors are, such as crisotinib, are effective for ALK positive tumors. And so now the FDA, uh, there exists a uh, companion test for ALK fusions um, um, uh, with, um, uh, done with fish um, as a companion test for treatment um, with crisotinib. And so here, for instance, you see that this uh, fish staining um, is a um, type of staining which is called um, break-apart probe. Um, so because, uh, because the fusion is um, basically uh, breaks apart 3 prime and 5 prime of the gene, then two probes are designed for 5 prime of the ALK gene and 3 prime of, uh, of the ALK gene. And um, you can see that if these dots are separate in space, then it means there is a fusion there. So the two parts of the genes are brought apart. At the same time, if you see co-localization, co-localization of these signals, it means that the gene is intact. So, and here you see uh, the waterfall plot, which indicates the level of response of patients um, to crizotinib, and these yellow bars are ALK fusion positive tumors. So, it means that most of the responding tumors are ALK positive. So another type of a biomarker is a gene, um, gene expression based. And here I'm giving you an example of a um, gene expression signature developed by Oncotype DX, which is composed of some 21 genes. Um, so um, the, the problem in breast cancer patients that are treated with hormonal therapy uh, is that only minority of, of them recur. So it means that more than 85% of them may not need additional chemotherapy. And so there is a need to, to predict the risk of recurrence of patients. And so, um, so the development of this gene signature has started from um, accumulation of some 250 candidate genes from the literature and then evaluating them in three independent studies uh, involving a total of 400 and some 50 patients and development of a RT-PCR quantitative assay to measure uh, expression level from FFP tissues, which is a special type of archival tissue. And as a result, uh, this test now is, a, is um, approved for uh, evaluation of recurrence in known negative ER positive breast tumors who were treated with hormonal therapy. So this is yet another type of a marker, which is based on the epigenetic signature uh, in colon cancer. Um, and this signature is actually um, a whole genome signature or transcriptome signature pattern. So one of the molecular aberrations observed in colon cancer um, are, um, you know, um, differential epigenetic events. And so this heat map shows that um, in colon cancer patients, uh, the tumors have different levels of uh, methylation of CPG islands in promoter regions, which leads to transcriptional silencing of those um, um, regions. And so in normal tissues, um, basically there is no hypermethylation of a, um, a certain subset of genes. But um, in cancer patients, uh, there are two subtypes of colon cancers, the ones that have um, low level of um, 
um, methylation in promoter regions, and these were called simplo, and they alone were associated with poor outcome. There is also another subgroup that was called simp high, which had very high frequency of uh, hypermethylation of promoter regions, and that subgroup was. Um, um, very controversial, so it, it was not clear what's the association with outcome, and other factors were suspected to be contributing to this, including microsatellite instability and BRAF mutations. And then um, the paper in Clinical Cancer Research in 2010 has clearly demonstrated that a combination of uh, SIMP high status with microsatellite stability actually is associated with the, um, with the most adverse effect right there. And this is a hazard ratio, which I will describe to you what it is later. It's a metric of uh, how, s how strong the effect of a certain marker is on the outcome. And uh, hazard ratio of 1 means that there is no effect. Hazard ratio greater than 1 means that there is an effect. And the higher it is, the stronger the effect. Um, so now, this is an example of using individual cells rather than biological molecules as potential biomarkers. And CTCs are um, cells that are thought to be uh, shed by the tumor, so they um, detach from the primary site, from the primary tumor, and then they enter the bloodstream, and then they travel in the circulation, and then they uh, find the, another niche in the distant site, and they are believed to be able to see the mass study clone in a distant site. So, and these CTCs have, um, have received much attention over the last few years, and in particular as a potential biomarker. And it turns out that just a simple count of those cells in um, um, plasma of uh, uh, cancer patients is indicative of, of the disease aggressiveness and can be used um, um, to predict the uh, the outcome. So in breast cancer, for instance, right here, um, the um, count of more than five cells per mil means that the, the patient will be um, uh, doing very poorly, as opposed to less than five cells where there was a heterogeneity, but, it, but um, this cutoff of five cells seemed to be the, the best um, discriminator of the two outcome groups. Um, another example in neuroendocrine tumors where th there was a single CTC cell count that actually mattered. So patient who had at least one CTC uh, did um, way poorer than the ones who didn't have CTCs at all. And for the neuroendocrine tumors, um, the comparison was uh, was done with a conventional biomarker, which is coronagenin A. It's very uh, specific to neuroendocrine tumors, and uh, CTCs were shown to be even better discriminating biomarker than that established biomarker. So the development of the biomarker um, includes two main steps. First, identification, and then validation. So the identification is normally done um, using um, high-resolution profiling nowadays, um, such as microarray sequencing or mass spectrometry. And biomarkers are identified through um, comparison of um, molecular profiles between subgroups of samples. It can be tumor versus normal. It can be different subtypes of tumors. And the important consideration there is that there should be um, very careful study design to avoid bias in biomarker discovery. And I will give you some examples why that's so important. Uh, for example, um, when it comes to uh, tumor-specific biomarkers development, it is ideal to have matched um, tumor and normal samples from the same patients. It's not always possible, but that's the ideal scenario. Once the biomarker is developed, then it needs to be validated. And there are different components. Um, each, of, each of them are very important um, that, um, that compose the whole process of validation. So first, there needs to be analytical validity. And that means that uh, the assay that um, is developed for screening for a biomarker status needs to be reproducible, sensitive, and specific. 
And then clinical validity and clinical utility are very important aspects of validation. So clinical validity is um, answers this, the question how reliably the biomarker divides the populations of tumors. Um, and very important aspect is that validation always needs to be done on the independent cohort that was not touched at all at the stage of the biomarker identification. And then clinical utility, I already described it to you. So it means what type of the biomarker application we're dealing with, prognostic, diagnostic, predictive, and then um, how well how strong the association of a biomarker, so the statistical significance. And then there are other considerations such as size of the effect. So for instance, if you have a, a specific mutation, how much it um, affects the outcome. If it's just only slightly, then it's not a good biomarker. If the presence of the mutation means that the um, you know, survival drops dramatically, then this is a good biomarker. So an, exa uh, an example of the uh, established clinical utility is KRAS mutations in colorectal cancer. So just um, to go through this, um, um, so the EGFR is a um, transmembrane receptor of tyrosine kinase family, and it's very important in um, signal transduction, and it affects a number of molecular um, molecular mechanisms in, in the cell. Uh, in tumors, there is a frequent upregulation of uh, EGFR, and um, against EGFR, a number of treatments have been developed. Um, however, not all the patients um, who have um, upregulation of EGFR respond equally well to this treatment, and a number of mechanisms have been uh, implicated in the resistance, either intrinsic or acquired, and they include EGFR mutations or alternative pathways, and importantly, the activation, independent activation of downstream signaling pathways such as PI3 kinase and RAS and RAF um, axis. And what's interesting about this RAS, uh, RAF axis is that mutations in KRAS are very frequent. In colorectal carcinoma, it's um, from 40 to 45 percent. And um, um, it, so the mutations in KRAS are associated with poor survival on their own. Um, and um, <clears throat> so it was noted um, that in patients who were treated with EGFR, the ones who were responding did not have any mutations in KRAS, whereas those that were resistant to EGFR had some sort of um, activating mutations in, in that gene. And then in vitro studies uh, further demonstrated that indeed KRAS mutations um, contribute quite a lot to the resistance of tumors to EGFR treatment. And then um, there were four prospective clinical trials commenced to investigate the effect of KRAS mutations to the treatment. And they all gave consistent results that uh, mutant KRAS um, confers resistance to the EGFR treatment. And now there is a uh, companion test of mutations um, together with the uh, EGFR treatment. So here I'm showing you uh, the summary of these clinical trials. And here you can see the response rate in KRAS RAS wild type patients, it's uh, pretty significant, whereas there is virtually no response in, in KRAS mutant tumors. And it was recapitulated well in other clinical trials, in this one, for example. So now the example of little or no clinical utility are genomic markers in prostate cancer. So here um, I am showing you, I already mentioned to you that nomogram, nomograms for prostate cancer are quite popular. And um, one of the reasons is that prostate cancer is quite unique in this regard um, because it is it has a very, uh, uh, very long natural history. So patients have usually um, lived with cancer for more than a decade. Um, and then um, another complication is that there is a single histological subtype that is predominant dominant for prostate cancer. So we can't really even start with, um, with uh, identification of um, 
um, histological subtype specific molecular signatures. And yet, even though there is one um, most common uh, histological subtype, the level of response may um, and the outcome may be very different. And uh, so um, here what I'm showing you is a summary of accuracy of um, a number of nomograms that have been developed by different groups. And you can see that uh, the accuracy ranges from something like 0.7 to 0.9. And uh, for example, in this um, paper, what I'm, I'm just showing one of the examples. This is not the only study that has been published. Um, but uh, they were trying to derive a gene expression signature that would add to the nomograms and would improve the accuracy of prediction. And even though they do show that nomograms alone have less separation, just a second, less separation than um, nomograms in combination with gene expression data, so this is a survival uh, experience of the two groups, uh, still um, the accuracy of a combination marker is not significantly higher than the nomogram alone. And this, is, this, this paper is just one of the examples. There are many, many papers like that who have demonstrated basically a failure um, in case of prostate cancer, unfortunately. Yes? Nomogram? Nomogram is a, um, it's a sort of a scoring system that takes into account a number of clinical parameters of a patient's disease, and then based on that, uh, um, on on that set of parameters, it calculates the score that um, is a uh, risk assessment of uh, of cancer progression or recurrence or poor outcome. And this is basically, you know, um, uh, nomograms are, you know, a set of statistical formulas that take into account. Uh, binary or continuous data from uh, different clinical parameters. They sum it all up. They weigh um, individual clinical parameters in some way, and then they spit out a certain score. Isn't that the Gleason score? No, Gleason score is completely Just different. No, no, no. It's it's a different a Gleason score is a um, uh, is a grade of tumor. It's a grading system. So this um, slide. Um, gives you an example of a very rigorous and very good clinical validation of biomarkers, which unfortunately is a rarity these days. So the majority of biomarkers that you see published in the medical literature are not validated in the proper way, unfortunately. So um, this um, was a uh, really great effort on the part of um, several, insti uh, several research institutes. They have collected more than 400 lung cancers at different sites, and four, in, four institutions profiled independently these tumors with the same microarray platform. And then the data processing was um, unified across all of the centers. And centers have um, uh, had an opportunity to develop their own biomarkers. Um, and um, they needed to develop the biomarker on completely independent cohort and then validate those biomarkers on two independent cohorts of reasonable size. And that validation was made blinded. So it means that um, researchers were not allowed to know what outcome is um, the real outcome for those patients in the validation cohorts, which is like the best of the, the ideal validation. And then, uh, so here I'm just showing you um, uh, different um, uh, biomarkers, which were mostly gene signatures that they have analyzed. And um, they tried it with, um, uh, without clinical information, in combination with clinical information. And then they did um, validation using Kaplan-Meier and then um, using rock curves. And uh, basically, they have selected the best uh, discriminating biomarker, which is shown right here which was just, um, it's, it's actually irrelevant at this point what kind of genes there were there, but just to make a point um, that really it's very important to, uh, to do a correct um, validation of a biomarker so that it will perform as expected and will be clinically useful. Now, this paper um, is an example of a very poor biomarker 
um, very biased biomarker. So what the authors try to do is to develop a signature, uh, um, a serum peptide signature for discrimination of cancers um, from um, healthy um, uh, states and uh, they have compiled um, three cohorts for different cancer types and then controls um, and all of these samples were uh, from completely unrelated um, um, patients and so as a result for instance for prostate cancer they had a cohort of some 30 patients uh, males certainly uh, w with average age of 66 six, and the controls were 33 healthy individuals with average age of 34, which is way younger, and then most of those uh, were females. So now this biomarker that they have um, claimed they have developed are related to the age and sex, but not prostate cancer at all. So now I would like to move on to the second part. And um, so would you like to, uh, to take a five minutes break? Okay, so... Um, Let's resume. So um, now I will tell you about the statistical aspects of biomarker development. I will uh, describe to you the survival analysis, what it's for and how it's done, and then we will proceed with the lab where you will be trying uh, to do survival analysis by yourself. So, so the identification of biomarkers um, can be done through either supervised analysis or unsupervised analysis. So uh, in supervised analysis, we know the outcome subgroups, uh, for example, responders versus non-responders, and then we perform molecular profiling and we identify uh, biomarkers that are unique to each of the subgroups. And the example of that would be the KRAS mutations in responders versus non-responders to EGFR, as I described to you earlier. In the unsupervised analysis, there is an uh, additional step that precedes um, uh, this process, and that step is the uh, unsupervised identification of the outcome subgroups. Um, so we first... Um, uh, do the unsupervised identification of um, subtypes, for example, um, of tumors, and then we proceed uh, with marker identification. So the example of the latter scenario is um, is this Metabrick uh, paper published in Nature in, in 2012, uh, which was fantastic um, paper uh, involving uh, 2,000 breast tumors uh, collected both, both from Canada and Europe. And here uh, you see a survival curves for individual genomic subgroups that they have identified based on the genomic profiling. And you can see that those subgroups were indeed very much associated with different outcomes. And for those who are not familiar with the Kaplan-Meier curves, um, I should have said that actually earlier, that uh, the lower the curve, the poorer the survival. So patients die or recur um, uh, in shorter period of time. And so they have identified genomic subgroups, they have associated those groups with outcome, and then they have validated the signatures that they have identified for each individual groups um, uh, in independent cohorts. So how is a biomarker or classifier, as it's uh, often called, developed? So there are two distinct um, distinct um, stages, discrimination and prediction. So the discrimination, so we start with um, uh, molecular profiling, for example, expression profiling of a um, group of uh, patients, two groups of patients. One of them, for example, respond to treatment. Others don't respond to treatment. Then we, we compare these two subgroups with the help of a so-called classification rule. Uh, and then we get a classifier, which is a um, set of genes with a certain uh, classification rule. So they, for example, they need to be upregulated in responders, and then those genes need to be downregulated in uh, resistant tumors. And so this part is called um, discrimination. 
And then once the classifier is identified, when the new patient comes in, we do molecular profiling for, the, for his or her tumor, and then we try to predict the response to treatment based on the behavior of that classifier. And that part is called prediction. This slide summarizes all common steps in the process of uh, building and validating a classifier. So basically, we start with a learning or training set, and we develop a classifier, as I just, just described to you. So this is a set of tumors again, right? Uh, we develop a classifier, which we, we, um, uh, we need to test on the independent test set and evaluate its performance on the independent set. So independent set means that these tumor samples come from totally different patients, which were never included into the training set. So these two sets are completely independent. However, one needs to make sure that these sets, learning and test set, needs to be equally distributed with regard to the um, number of um, parameters, um, race, um, age, um, family history, and so on and so forth. So they need to be equally distributed. So they need to be very similar. I'm sorry, can you explain that all but V subset and V subset? Yes, I will do that just in a second. So then, yes. Can you explain the biggest difference in the number? Uh, besides the fact that they're completely different groups, it's a number of individuals. The more the better. The more the better. So, so you want your learning set to be... Uh, so if you have a choice, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say. There is, no, there is no golden rule that you need to, you know, to select your set which is larger as a learning set and then a smaller set set aside. Um, you know, sometimes people do that uh, because you want to build as robust biomarker, just in a second, um, as robust biomarker as possible, and then you can do a validation on the smaller cohort with the hope that you have built the strongest biomarker possible. And that's actually how the V cross-validation works. I'll describe to you in a second. I guess uh, it also depends on how big the, how much data you have. If you have enough data, you can split it in half. Exactly. That's what, that's what uh, very often is done, because there is no luxury of having completely independent tumor cohorts. And then um, what people uh, like to do is um, they split they only one um, tumor cohort that they have in two, and then they use one as a uh, training set and the other uh, part as independent test set. That's what they do as well. well that was not my question. No. But, uh, my question was, in the independent set, you said you need to have, as, uh, um, so for the test set, you need as various as possible, like different races, different... No, I what I'm what I said by equally distributed, right? That's yeah, your yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it means that uh, there should be uh, similar distribution of those parameters into data sets. So, so for example, you can't really take uh, your as your training set uh, in case of prostate cancer, for instance, um, men who are older than eighty years, and then your independent test set would be people who are less than sixty years. You can't do that. So do you, what's the procedure? Do you choose them by hand or you do a random sample or you do a stratification and then huh. a random sample from? So, uh, so these days actually, it's um, more often done with manual curation. So very carefully, these sets are compo compiled from available patients. And, um, you know, it's it's very important step. And, you know, people um, who actually do this right. They spend substantial amount of time um, on compiling the appropriate training and test sets. And unfortunately, um, th there is no luxury of having hundreds and hundreds of different patients. You know, tumor banks are quite limited in numbers because there are a number of other criteria with regard to the collection of samples and the quality and the tumor content and, you know, classification of a patient's disease. So a lot of um, uh, criteria are used uh, in order to select a particular sample uh, in, into con and take it into consideration. So it's a manual curation, which is very careful and is usually done by biostatisticians. statisticians. Yeah. So when you're using a training set and evaluation, a lot of papers are coming out where they're using multiple training sets from the literature. Mm -hmm. And there, 
you're almost restricted to what is there in the literature in terms of how, how do you control that? Well, uh, so just because I mentioned that, you know, some, uh, there is a, you know, multitude of bioinformatic papers that, um, you know, originate from bioinformatic groups who are not affiliated with um, hospitals and they don't have access to tumor banks. And so they leverage what's published out there. And then they try to develop some, you know, uh, unique uh, classifier based on some machine learning techniques or some, you know, sophisticated algorithms. Um, and then they leverage multiple independent data sets to show that the classifier works. And then they may have their own small tumor bank to validate on. So it's just, so people trying to do with whatever they have. And so that's why I showed you an example, which is one of the very few examples in lung cancer where the um, development and validation of a biomarker was done in completely correct way. So, and that's why I'm, I'm trying to bring this up to you so that when you read the medical literature, you will be able to raise questions and evaluate the strength of a biomarker, whether the study was uh, correctly designed, whether all the validations uh, took place, and you know, so on and so forth. Can so, I yes, I, I will continue doing so. So, um, classifier that was um, developed on the training set. The, the best uh, estimation of its validity w will come from here when it tested on the independent test set and it gives uh, a certain um, uh, statistics from here but it can also be validated so-called um, uh, on the same training set and um, so how it, it is normally done is through cross validation right here so instead of using the entire training set for the development of a classifier, the entire set is um, split into five equal parts, for instance, at random. And then one set is set aside, one subset, and the rest four are used for the development of a classifier. And then once the classifier is developed, then it is being tested on the remaining subset. And in that case, it will be five-fold cross-validation it can be tenfold cross-validation, depending on the size of the cohort, depending on... Uh, and so basically then this procedure is repeated. So five times, for instance, or more times. You can, you can make um, multiple random uh, subsets of five from your given uh, training set. It can... the um, subtype of this uh, cross-validation is leave one out cross-validation, which means that uh, you just leave one sample out then you develop classifier on all of the rest of the samples and then you test classifier in the remaining single sample and then you repeat it all over for all of the samples. And then you average your performance across all those iterations. Anyone? Yes. Sure. So is there um, a standard to pick which cross-validation that they use? No, there is no standard. No best. No. No, there are, again, there are no golden rules for that. So. Um, so basically, the more iterations you do, the better. But at the same time, you may be limited with very small cohort size. So for instance, 30 patients. You split them into five, and then each individual subset is very small. And so even if you do multiple iterations with random subsamplings, still you end up with quite a you know, quite wide range of your um, biomarker performances. And that gives you a huge error rate for that. So, you know, there are always trade-offs that one needs to consider when doing this kind of stuff. And so basically all of those uh, performances estimations, uh, they're called different ways and all of them contribute to the final assessment of the performance of the biomarker. So basically here, um, uh, different metrics are used uh, for performance assessment. So um, the how accurate the classifier, how well it classifies um, the learning set, and this would be the resubstitution error rate. So this is just for your reference. And then um, one thing that I will mention and show you how it works, these are so-called ROC curves, receiver operating curves, which are used to compare different classifiers together and pick the best one. 
So um, I will tell you about the confusion matrix because I think it's it's very simple by itself and then if you know it, then you will be able to understand what are those metrics that are normally found in the medical literature describing the performance of biomarkers. So you probably have heard many times the sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, and it's basically very simple. So we um, construct this confusion matrix, this table, uh, comparing, for instance, the um, performance of our novel biomarker relative to the golden standard. And the golden standard, for instance, uh, will be the pathology evaluation, whether the sample is benign or tumor. And here's our marker that also tells us on the molecular level whether the sample is normal or benign or um, tumor. And basically, we know how many, which of those samples in our cohorts are positive according to the pathology. And this many of those are also predicted by, by the biomarker, and then these would be our true positives. And likewise, these would be true negatives that are predicted by both methods to be negative for cancer. And in the rest two columns, we have false positives and false negatives. And so basically, these metrics, sensitivity, specificity, and uh, predictive values are fractions of those red components to the sum of the rows or columns, and that's it. And then the accuracy that you also often find in the medical literature is a combination of these and can be formulated through sensitivity and specificity in the following formula. So now you will know where they come from. So um, just giving you um, one example here with a CA125 levels. This is a marker of the disease uh, progression in ovarian cancer, and endometrial cancer here as well. Um, so and here you see the rock curve. I will describe to you how they are um, used and how they may be interpreted. A couple of slides further. And here you can see that very often these metrics of um, of a biomarker are reported, and these are in percentages, sensitivity, specificity, and so um, based on different cutoff value of calling the tissue uh, cancerous or benign, so see this is a high concentration, this is low concentration, they have decided that this cutoff is the best, it discriminates well enough with this specificity, this sensitivity, this accuracy. So what are the rock curves? So rock curves are receiver operating characteristics curves, and it's a graphical plot of a sensitivity uh, versus one minus specificity. Or it can be um, formulated through true positive rate versus false positive rate. And so basically this rock space is uh, divided in half by this diagonal line, which is a non-discrimination line. So if the rock curve is below this diagonal, then there is no discrimination for that marker, uh, by that marker. Uh, something that is above the discrimination line is a um, um, working biomarker, and the closer it is to this upper left corner, which is the perfect classification, the better. So this is a real example here where you can see multiple rock curves for multiple uh, methods, and you can see that this one is the best. So that's how, um, how the um, rock curves are used. And so um, basically the shape of the curve matters because uh, we normally like to use the area under this curve. And the more the area under the curve, AUC, the better. If it approaches to 1, then this is a perfect classification. Yeah? So these are these, this is just an abstract example, right? Um, it just has you know nothing to do with uh, with our topic today. But there are different methods to um, to perform the same classification, right? To call say either molecular profile being coming from benign <coughs> tissue or from a tumor tissue, right? So you don't know. You receive your molecular profile, and you have your biomarker. You have another golden standard biomarker, you have another third biomarker that you have developed, you have five more uh, biomarkers that you have developed, and now you want to select the best one. And so you do the rock curve, you make the rock curve, and then you pick the best one based on the rock curve, for instance. So if you have a gene expression profile biomarker, uh -huh. um, expression profile, uh -huh. 
and you do a couple of my error and see there's a difference uh, in a validation cohort. Mm -hmm. What gets fed into an ROC curve from there to an ROC curve? How do you transition from there to an ROC curve? So um, what you do is um, with a ROC curve, so once you find an association with, a, with outcome, it's good, right? But then um, it does not, so it tells you that a biomarker is associated with outcome. But you don't really know how sensitive and how specific that biomarker is. And so rock curve gives you a, um, an opportunity to estimate that, right? So for instance, um, uh, you can say that you, at this point here, you will have this much of false positive and this much of true positive rate. So, and then you can say, okay, um, you know, I can estimate the true positive rate and false positive rate for the biomarker, and then whether whether it is reasonable for the setting of a particular cancer. So, for instance, I am very happy with this true positive rate, and I can, you know, I can risk this false positive rate, which is fine. I will accept that, and so this biomarker will work for me. So my question is, how do you calculate the true positive? Ah, well, I have an extra slide in the very end, which describes how rock curves are constructed. Um, so it's an extra slide. I think it's not included in here. They're, they're printed. But, um, oh, so they're printed. So they are right in the end, and I would encourage you to go um, <clears throat> after I'm finished. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think it's. Um, is third to the last. It, it describes how the rock curve is constructed. So, yeah, so, uh, so uh, this rock curve is, is constructed um, based on the false positive rate and true positive rate as the threshold for the biomarker changes. And that's what that slide is actually is about. It's actually quite nice. I, I love it. But uh, you know, last year when I was uh, uh, when I was giving this module, people weren't really interested, so I, I took that out as a supplementary slide. But you're welcome to refer to that. Okay. So now let's come to the survival data and survival analysis. So I uh, mentioned to you in the beginning that there is a special type um, of clinical data um, that has something to do um, with the time uh, for a, some event to occur. Um, so <clears throat> these are um, uh, these are listed here. They are in the red frame. Uh, so it is a certain time from certain fixed point in time to a uh, uh, from uh, one fixed event to another fixed event. For instance, um, time from the surgery. Uh, to the recurrence of the disease. If there was neurosurgery, there were uh, there was some a new adjuvant therapy time time from the therapy, um, and uh, for example, um, when uh, there was a regression of a tumor, and then to the relapse. So this time uh, from fixed event to a fixed event um, is a some sort of a survival time. This data is called survival times very broadly. It can be time to death, time, time to the recurrence. Um, um, it's very broadly called survival times. And it requires very special analytical approaches, which is called survival analysis. So survival analysis has three main components that are very often used by researchers. And you can find um, uh, these type of analysis um, reports um, um, pretty much everywhere in the literature. So um, one of the goals is to estimate the probability of individual to survive for a given period of time, given that um, it has this set of characteristics of its tumor, of his or her tumor. And for that purpose, we use Kaplan-Meier survival curves, or life tables, which I use to construct the Kaplan-Meier curves. Another question uh, that might be um, addressed is to compare the survival experiences of two different groups of individuals. Um, and, um, you know, so basically, 
it's, it's just a different test, so you can think of it as a comparison of the two Kaplan-Meier curves, and just to have a certain metric, a p-value, that will tell you whether this is indeed statistically significantly different. And for that, we use log rank test. And finally, um, uh, if we want to, um, to identify multiple uh, variables that collectively contribute to the risk, to the poor outcome, and evaluate a contribution of each individual uh, variable, then for that purpose we use the multivariate Cox regression model. So survival times, um, as I mentioned, is the time from a fixed point to a fixed end point. And uh, here are the examples. So from surgery to death or recurrence or re relapse, from diagnosis to death, recurrence, relapse, and from uh, time of treatment to death, recurrence, or relapse. So from, from here, you can see that actually survival time is a very broad definition. And it's up to the researcher, up to the biostatistician, and up to clinicians to decide which survival time is um, the most informative. For example, for prostate cancer, it is a biochemical recurrence. So once the um, PSA rises, then um, it's a surrogate of a um, recurrence of the disease. And we normally use biochemical recurrence as our survival time. Death from the disease is another frequently used survival time. So one inherent feature of the survival times that make it so unique and unsuitable for any uh, common statistical methods is that almost never we observe the event of interest in all of the subjects. And what I mean by that, usually the um, studies, the clinical studies, are performed within a limited period of time, and we collect the results and we publish the results, right? So, for instance, patients have been followed up for five years, for ten years, for five years, and um, we had 100 patients in the beginning. So they were all followed up by five years. By the end of five years, some of them may have recurred or died. Some of them may not have recurred or died. So it means that our event of interest, well, from the statistical point of view, certainly, uh, recurrence or death has not occurred for a fraction of patients. And this is a problem for common statistical methods. That's why a um, distinct set of analytical approaches have been developed. So this kind of data is normally called censored data. And um, um, censored observations um, basically arise whenever the dependent um, variable of interest represents the time to a terminal event and the duration of the study is limited in time. Right. So again, as I said, we perform the study within limited period of time, five years. And the event of interest has not happened yet. So we just know that it will probably happen sometime in the future. We don't know when. The only fact that we know is that it has not happened yet by the end of five years. So um, from the statistical point of view, it's considered to be incomplete observation. And um, these are the examples of that. So death of the disease still alive, in social studies, survival of marriage still married, and drop out of um, school still in school. Um, so these are um, uh, examples of censored observations. And there are different types of censored observations. I'm not going to get into that right now. What I will just say is that in the medical field, uh, most frequently we use type 1 um, censoring, and it can be either right or left censoring. So this is a Kaplan-Meier curve um, that is, um, as I mentioned, used to uh, evaluate the survival experience of two groups, and then also can be used to, uh, to estimate the risk um, or the potential, out the, the potential outcome or survival of any given patient that has certain characteristics of um, his or her tumor. So um, the, the way it is constructed is that uh, patients are followed uh, for a certain period of time. And uh, for instance, we have two groups here. 
based on certain status. Um, it's, it's irrelevant at this point, uh, based on what status, right? So we're comparing the two groups of patients. And for each of the groups of patients, at any given point in time, we, we calculate a fraction who are still, say, who are still alive. Right, who have not died yet, but once a given once one patient dies, then we need to recalculate that fraction again, and so that's why um, these functions are step functions. So once you see the drop right there, it means that at this point, within that group, one patient died. So uh, it, this just explains to you why this is a step function, and so basically we compute. Um, proportions of um, patients who have um, uh, reached the event of interest, who have died, for example, at um, each time point when we lose one patient. And then this is called a life table. And then that life table is visualized as a Kaplan-Meier curve right here. So now how do we um, interpret these um, um, curves? So first of all, um, this function is called a um, survival probability function, and it's a just a uh, geometric progression of those fractions that I described to you here. And uh, these tick marks are censored observations. So it means that you know uh, these people have not reached the event of interest, and they have, um, for example, fallen out of the study. So how? What's the main usage of the Kaplan-Meier curve? First of all to see um, how different the survival experiences are visually, but not numerically, number one. Number two, if we have a patient who shares all other characteristics, molecular character, clinical characteristics, with the red group, um, what is a probability of that patient to survive for two and a half months? And then the probability is 50%. What is the probability of the patient um, uh, which shares characteristics with that group to survive for uh, two and a half months, and then the probability would be 90%. Okay? So that's, um, that's how basically these Kaplan-Meier curves are interpreted and used. But then um, these Kaplan-Meier curves do not, um, they tell you whether they're different the survival experiences of the two group, but they don't tell you how much different. So we don't get any specific p-value. And for that, we use a log rank test, which compares the survival experiences of the two groups and gives you a p-value. So this is a formula, which is um, very similar to a chi-squared test, um, uh, comparing fractions. And uh, so basically, um, here I'm giving you an example uh, that I already showed you before the association of KRAS mutations with outcome. And yes, the separation of the two curves means that um, indeed there is different survival of patients with or without mutations in KRAS. And now the log rank test gives us a p-value. It tells us how much, so how significantly different they are. Um, so, so again, this type of censoring is usually type one, and if you know, uh, if you want to know the details, I would refer you to the statistical um, books. So I was, you know, um, I, I, I don't think that you really need to get into that uh, level of detail unless you're a biostatistician. So, but it's normally dictated by the type of study that you have, and the. Um, the way of recording your survival times, right? And the way that, you know, when patient was accrued into the study. Yeah, I was just so. wondering, because like, um, every time we're given kind of like a pipeline to work through, uh -huh. right? So first do this, then, I don't know, do a capital monitor curve, do a model, and like along the way, do we have to assess this censoring, or is it just assumed to be random all the time? Uh, what do you mean assess censoring? Well, sometimes, like, patients drop out for a reason, and it's not randomly just... Oh, is that right? Well, um, I normally like to include censored observations because they do contribute to the Kaplan-Meier curve. However, only to the left part of it. 
right? So uh, the trick about the censored observations is that, well, they have participated up to this point, right? So they do contribute to the left-hand side to these proportions that were calculated here. But once they drop out, they stop contributing to the right-hand side. That's why you see a number of these of these uh, censored observations here, but there is no more drop. So they don't really contribute. So, um, you know, I, I tend to see that, that censored observations are helping. They are improving the power. No, no, it's just the, sometimes the way in which patients drop out, there's a pattern. Mm -hmm. And if, like, you don't account for that pattern, then you, you're biasing your results. What kind of pattern? I, I'm curious. <laughs> I, you know, I've never, I've, I've never experienced um, okay. any specific pattern. I <laughs> yeah, well, that would be lovely. Okay. I would love to know about that okay. because that would be something, something very interesting. Normally, um, people just move out to different city, or uh, I mean, they may die from another you know, disease, right? And um, they may be lost to follow up with some other reasons. But I've never seen the pattern. I would love, I would love to read something about that. That would be okay. interesting. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? Here, I'll look it up. Ah, so they may drop out because they, okay, well, yeah, that could be, but, um, uh, yeah, so. Uh, that they, maybe they don't tolerate the treatment that much, you mean, right? Yeah, it, yeah, it could be, it could be. Um, when you do something like this, is it important to make sure that you have uh, the same amount of patients in both groups? It's not necessarily that you deal with the same number of patients in two groups. Okay. But like, because the step, the step down is yeah. proportionate to how many patients in That's a very good point, actually. That's a very good point. So like seven patients could have died in the right group, but if yeah. some patients died yeah. in the green group, but in the bigger group, then you're not going to see such a... Exactly. Exactly. That's a very good point. Are you a mathematician? No, I'm no. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is exactly the reason why we have such a big steps in this uh, curve and small steps in that curve because we have way fewer patients in here. And the fraction is very much influenced when you lose one patient. So is that taken into account when you sort of have a value? Yes, it is, it is taken into account. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say it's taken when you uh, do a p value. What you compare two groups is not necessarily that you have the same. Uh, it's not necessary. Same number, no, it's, it's not. Into it's taken into account. So it basically goes, you know, at each and every step, it goes and calculates the fraction and then the significance of the difference of those fractions, and then it sums it up in geometric progression. And it's the, the variance term in, in the log graph. There is a variance term. Ah, uh, variance. And that should. Uh, what, what do you mean variance? The variance term is the function of the... Uh, uh -huh. yeah. The, of the sample size. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right, yeah. Okay, so now it tells, it tells whether they're different. Yeah, sure. Can the underlying you know, tumor or something be like radically different between two patients which receive the same treatment? Uh, and would that affect these type of um, Well, first of all, it's it, you know these Kaplan-Meier curves are not really related, you know, to treatment that much, right? So you you wouldn't really compare. Um, but um, so. So one thing to do is to make sure that you um, that you um, have a good representation of uh, clinical parameters in two groups of yours, right? So for instance, if cancer is age-related, that you don't really have, you know, um, um, your cohort very biased in terms of age of patients. So, um, 
but but then you know but then again it may be related to age the fact that you didn't really know right and then when you start following up those patients and you finally see that they fall into two very significantly different subgroups and you identify age as a significant significant contributor to the survival, then that's your finding. So your poorly behaving, clinically behaving subgroup of patients are older patients. And then you report that, you know, age is very, uh, you know, very strong contributor to the overall survival. And then I will talk very briefly about the Cox regression model that um, is designed to evaluate the relative contribution of multiple parameters into the overall survival. And then using that model, you can assess the age or some other parameters in terms of the contribution. I think ideally in the group, everybody is exactly the same except for like one trait in the two groups, and then the survival of the measuring exactly that effect. Right? Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Have, yeah. But the more differences there are, the more they'll kind of confound what you're finding. Yeah, and that's actually almost always the case that there is a combination of factors that um, sometimes dependent, sometimes independent, that uh, contribute to the overall outcome. You have about four slides left, and we're where three o'clock is in. Oh, okay. Do you yeah. want to finish your slide? Yeah, I think so. I think I think we we better finish now because um. Okay. Um. So as I said, log rank test it gives you p value, so it gives you the significance of difference, and then uh, another metric which is called hazard ratio tells you how much different. So it basically gives you one um, uh, one value uh, greater than one or less than one, um. And it is a hazard ratio, um, which is a, um, you know, comparing the risks in two groups, group one and group two. So um, if a hazard ratio is less than one, then it means that your group one um, is um, less associated with poor outcome or, le or weaker associated with uh, poor outcome than group two. And on the opposite, when you have it greater than one, it means that group um, that uh, the group that is is in your enumerator here is associated stronger with a poor outcome than um, the other group. And so here, for instance, I'm giving you an example from the Oncotype DX um, gene signature for breast cancer. So they report the hazard ratio there. And they compare it uh, in the uh, multivariable Cox regression model with um, other parameters such as age and clinical tumor size. And the recurrence score based on the gene expression signature was the most powerful, the most informative. So it means that the group that has high recurrence score is three times more likely uh, to recur um, sooner than the group with a lower recurrence score. And compare it with clinical tumor size, the effect is much less, and the age is really not that much contributing at all. The first two were not significant in all the time here. Uh? Right? The first two were not significant, right? Because the other measure was crossing the one. Right? Yeah, well, they don't, yeah, well, this one is not significant, right? And neither either is this, yeah, yeah. Okay. So to evaluate, um, again, the contribution of multiple variables into the overall survival, um, um, we normally use Cox proportional um, regression model. And um, so basically, this is the formula here. It's quite complex statistical um, um, approach. Um, this is a hazard function, which is um, related to the survival function that I showed you in Kaplan-Meier here. So it's just the survival would be an exponential of the negative of this hazard function. So the higher the hazard function, the stronger association with poor outcome. And um, basically takes into account multiple variables 
which may or may not be independent, and it will tell you whether they're independent or dependent. Um, so these are axes, our variables, and then the regression coefficients, um, Bs, B1 to Bp, these are the coefficients that will be estimated by the regression model, and um, the magnitude of those coefficients actually tells you uh, how much of a contribution individual variable has. So how do we interpret the Cox model? Uh, so this is the table um, that shows you some examples and basically two main uh, facts. So first of all, we look at the p-value, of course, number one. And then number two, we look at individual um, coefficients from here, b, b1, b2, b3 coefficients. We look at the sign and the magnitude. So sign um, pertains the positive or negative association with poor outcome. So if it's negative, then it's associated with good outcome. If it's positive, then it's associated with poor outcome. And then the larger it is, the coefficient, the stronger association with poor outcome. So for example here, so here, uh, the coefficient, the regression coefficient is negative, and it's, um, um, it's, um, now uh, transposed to the percentage of a relative risk. And so you see uh, that um, if we increase serum albumin by one, then it means that the risk is not increasing, but it's actually decreasing. It will be 95% of that, um, um, of the lower level of serum albumin. As opposed to here, the serum bilirubin, so it has very um, large coefficient here, and it translates to this much increase of, of uh, relative risk if, if uh, this is increased by 1. So And by 1, it comes from this formula. I'm not going to go into this level of detail. So basically what you need to know is the p-value number 1 and sign and magnitude of a coefficient. So, and here um, I am showing you, this is our last slide, I am showing you this again uh, from lung cancer uh, biomarker development example that I gave you earlier. So again, the higher the hazard ratio, the stronger the association with poor outcome. And one thing that I wanted to emphasize here is that when you do a, um, I'm sorry, multivariable Cox regression, it becomes more powerful than univariate. So, for instance, here you can see that hazard ratio is quite low in the univariate analysis, so it means that only one parameter, that gene expression signature, was taken into account. So, um, uh, so it was thought that only the status of the gene expression was contributing to the um, overall survival. And then if we take that gene signature together with uh, multiple clinical parameters that can be dependent on the gene signature, and gene signature may be dependent on those clinical parameters, then you suddenly see a higher hazard ratio, um, unfortunately higher confidence interval, but still um, it is uh, more powerful than univariate Cox regression. So this is quite complex statistical approach, and I would highly advise you not to do it yourself unless you're a biostatistician. So it, it, is, it is just absolutely a must to involve biostatistician into running this. So this was my last slide. So we'll take a coffee break if you'd like to do so.